Okay, we're going to go over uh, chapter 16, aerobic gram-positive bacilli, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time. We did talk about some of the basic characteristics of gram-positive rods, but I'm going to highlight some of the features of the, uh, the pathogens in this chapter. So uh, let's go through the objectives. We've, we're familiar with these. We worked with them in class. <clears throat> Use them as you study, especially those case in points. So we're going to talk about, first we're going to believe, I believe we talk about listeria or carinibacterium. Uh, we'll talk about bacillus, which is a spore-forming gram-positive rod, and then we'll talk about the non-spore-forming gram-positive rods, which is your carinibacterium, your listeria, your cephalothrex, gardnerella, and then your branching non-spore-forming gram-positive rods, which is your nocardia. <clears throat> so there's some key characteristics about each of these organisms that you want to clue in on. Okay, and here's a good uh, flow chart to remember. So a catalase is an important test for your non-spore forming gram-positive rods. We see that here. Uh, here branching is a good characteristic. Nocardia is a branching gram-positive rod. So if you see that, it's you know that it's not one of these non-branching gram-positive rods. Okay, if you see spores, then you know off the bat that it must be a bacillus. Right, if it's aerobic, <clears throat> it must be a bacillus. H2S production is going to be an important test, and then we'll also talk about motility and bioesculin and hydrolysis, uh, but to differentiate between listeria and other gram positive rods. So, uh, clue in on those tests, re refresh yourself on those tests if you have forgotten. So Carinibacterium is uh, mostly normal flora, and it's found everywhere all over the body. And it has these club-shaped ends here. You can see them real well. Uh, they're often referred to as just diphthroids. So you've got gram-positive rods all over your body, and they're normal flora most of the time. Uh, one of our pathogens is Carinibacterium diphtheriae. And it's a pathogen. It produces this toxin, which is the major virulence factor. So that's how it causes the disease. And many times it begins like a flu-like uh, symptoms uh, with a mild sore throat. And then you'll see the infection invading the tonsils and moving down towards the larynx and deeper into the respiratory system, into the trachea. And there's, uh, you can actually see an obstruct, uh, obstruction in the breathing in the patients because there's so much of tissue death that goes on from the exposure to the toxin that's created by this organism. And then the organism can actually get into the bloodstream and travel to other areas of the body, and usually death occurs if the toxin and the organism gets to the heart, and we see cardiac failure when that happens. So some media that you want to think of when you uh, when you're dealing with Carinibacterium diphtheria, this is a link that you want to make in your mind. It's the Loeffler's Serum Auger, or just remember Loeffler's, and when you can use that that uh, media to uh, produce these metachromatic granules. And uh, I don't think I have a picture of that, um, <clears throat> but it's uh, just link the metachromatic granules and Loeffler's media in your head and think of diphtheria. And then another uh, media is the cysteine telluride auger, and this is probably much more important than Loeffler's because you'll see black colonies on cysteine telluride if it's uh, Corinibacterium diphtheria. Uh, also, Tinsdale media, you'll see grayish or black colonies with brown halos. So remember those morphologies and link those to this organism. <clears throat> The next pathogen we'll talk about is Listeria monocytogenes, and it is a non-spore-forming gram-positive rod. It's uh, common in nature. 
when humans get infected with this organism, usually it's because of infected fruits and vegetables that weren't washed well. Also, meats. Uh, this organism does like low temperatures. So dairy products that are refrigerated or the donor blood supply, which is refrigerated, listeria can survive and grow in those lower temperatures. <clears throat> so if a person ingests those products, they can... Uh, become sick. So in adults, it's typically not fatal. It's a mild flu-like symptom, uh, but it can become more serious. We can see some septicemia and meningitis uh, in immunocompromised people. And then uh, in pregnant women, we can see premature labor and spontaneous abortion. And probably the most important thing here is the tr um, transfer of listeria to the newborn. It can cause sepsis and meningitis in the newborn. So remember this, uh, meningitis in the newborn population can be caused by listeria. Can you remember a gram-positive cocci that is known for causing meningitis in newborns? I hope so because you need to be able to differentiate listeria and that gram-positive cocci. <clears throat> To do that, to determine if an organism is listeria, first of all, you want to do your gram stain, and you'll see a gram-positive, non-spore-forming cocobacilli. We're going to see look good growth on blood auger, and we'll see a very narrow zone of beta hemolysis, just like group B streptococcus. If you thought of that earlier, good job. Two points for you. We've got to be able to differentiate group B strep from listeria. They both have narrow zone of hemolysis and they both are major pathogens that cause meningitis in newborns. So here's the gram stain picture of listeria and what it looks like on a blood auger. And you see in the bottom right hand corner we have a camp test. And so where this organism meets the Staph aureus isolate, what you'll see for listeria is a block of hemolysis here. You can kind of see an enhanced hemolysis here. And it's in the shape of a block. Do you remember what the camp looks like for group B strep? I hope so. Uh, so in order to identify listeria, uh, you can check to see if it uh, grows well at 4 degrees Celsius. Uh, you can perform a catalase, and this can help you rule out streptococcus because a streptococcus is catalase negative, right? You can also use the hepurate and esculin hydrolysis uh, to help you identify listeria, and it's going to be positive. Do you remember the hepurate result for group B strep? Another useful test is the motility, and what we'll see for listeria is at 25 degrees Celsius at room temperature, we'll see an umbrella-shaped motility in, uh, of the growth in the media. Uh, if we do a hanging drop preparation, which is not uh, commonly done anymore, we'll see what's what's called like a tumbling motility. It's it's moving, uh, flipping head over heels. <clears throat> so here's the umbrella motility. Kind of, kind of a little difficult to see, but we can kind of see an umbrella right here. See that? And on this one, we don't have that umbrella up at the top. So definitely recognize umbrella motility and link that to listeria. And tumbling motility, link that to mot to a listeria. So again, here the camp test is going to be block-shaped uh, hemolysis for listeria as opposed to the arrow shape uh, that's produced with the group B strep. So make sure you're able to differentiate listeria from group B streptococcus. And what disease are these two organisms uh, commonly uh, found in? What kind of diseases do they cause? meningitis and newborns. Right, I knew you would get that. So here is a chart in your book that will help you differentiate between listeria, carinibacterium, which is other gram-positive rods, your group B strep, strep A galactica, and also enterococcus. So here we see that streptococcus is catalase negative, but our gram-positive rods are positive. 
We see esculin hydrolysis is positive, and group B strep esculin hydrolysis is negative. Here we have beta hemolysis is seen in both group B strep and listeria. Uh, motility, we have uh, umbrella-shaped motility for listeria, negative in group B strep. And here group B strep cannot, uh, it's kind of variable growth in 6.5% uh, sodium chloride, whereas listeria can grow. So I would focus on uh, the similarities and the differences differences between listeria and group B strep. So definitely know your catalase, your esculin hydrolysis, your motility, and your beta hemolysis. Your syphilithrix, rhusiopathiae. Uh, that's a tongue twister, right? It's a non-spore-forming gram-positive rod. It is catalase negative, so that helps us differentiate it from Corini bacterium and listeria. Uh, unique features here is that it's H2S positive when you inoculate a TSI, so that's very unique. Uh, also, a bottle brush formation in the growth of gelatin. Now, it's not gelatin positive, but we see this formation of growth described as a bottle brush form in the gelatin. Uh, so know that terminology and link it to your acephalothrex. It's capnophilic, so it needs CO2 to grow, and it grows on blood and chocolate. So we might see some gray, translucent, maybe some alpha hemolytic colonies. Here it is on sheet blood auger, and here's the gram-positive rods. Really nondescript, non-branching gram-positive rods. What I want you to focus on for your acephalothrex is the catalase reaction and the H2S reaction, and also the bottle brush growth in gelatin. Gardnerella vaginalis can actually be seen uh, in another part of your book, so you can check out page 510 also. Uh, it can grow aerobically and anaerobically. And that's why it's located in both places. So it's a gram-positive rod, but it can stain gram-variable. So GV is for gram-variable. Okay, so you might see a couple of them stain gram-positive and a couple stain gram-negative. Uh, some media that you want to link with Gardnerella is this human blood bilayer tween auger. Infections that we see caused by Gardnerella vaginalis is this bacterial vaginosis. And what we typically see in the patient is a fishy odor and a pH that is increased above 4.5. So uh, one of the best ways to diagnose uh, bacterial vaginalis is the presence of these clue cells that we see. And basically it's a squamous epithelial cell that you observe in a wet prep. So a female's vag vagina is swabbed, and the swab is placed into a mill of sterile saline. And then we stick a drop of that wet prep under the microscope, and we look for these uh, squamous epithelial cells that have bacteria lining the outside of the cells. And that it should be so thick that it blurs the edge of the cell. See that over here? And the presence of these clue cells is diagnostic for bacterial vaginalis. So it's not necessary to perform a culture. Uh, we can just use a wet prep much easier, much faster. The next organism we'll talk about is nocardia. This is a spore fo non spore forming branched gram positive rod. It's filamentous, they're very long branched. They may not stain with the gram stain very well, so they may appear beaded. Okay, so it may you may confuse them with cocci, long chains of cocci. So we'll see a good picture of this. One thing to note is uh, anytime you have what you think is long branched and beaded filamentous rods, you want to perform an acid fast stain. And if it's weakly acid fast positive, uh, that's a good sign that you're dealing with a nocardia. So here it is. See, we've got long strands, what looks like gram-positive cocci and chains, um, but they're actually gram-positive rods that aren't staining uniformly. So uh, what's this? This is a sinus granule with filamentous organisms. 
not a great picture. So here's what we would see on the gram stain for nocardia. And if we want to confirm that this is in fact a nocardia, we could do an acid fast stain. And here that is here on B, and you can stain it stain you can see that it stains a lot better. Acid fast stains will stain it pink, this bright fuchsia pink color. So we've got these long filamentous rods that are formed. So remember acid fast positive um, nocardia with these beaded filamentous gram positive rods. All right, so Bacillus is the next species we'll talk about, or genus we'll talk about. These guys are the only spore former gram positive rods that we'll talk about. And refresh yourself on spores. Why are they important? What uh, characteristics do they give the organisms that have them, that produce them? Uh, bacillus is catalase positive. The main pathogen here is Bacillus anthracis. Uh, it causes anthrax, typically in livestock, but humans can be uh, can acquire this infection through ingestion of the spores or uh, infection um, of a wound. So the morphology we see are these large spore-forming gram-positive bacilli. Uh, it is non-hemolytic on sheep blood auger, so remember that, and remember that it's non-modal. And that those t three characteristics help you. <clears throat> so we don't see Bacillus anthracis uh, very much. We saw it a lot more when we had a lot more people working with wool and dealing with lambs and sheep. Uh, because the Bacillus anthracis organism likes those types of animals. Um, <clears throat> we do see some cutaneous infections uh, from, with veg, uh, veterinarians, though, and, of course, uh, bioterrorist attacks. We had that issue back in, what was that, 2005, with uh, the Bacillus anthracis being mailed to uh, people around the country. So that was an example of pulmonary anthrax, and that was through the inhalation of spores. And we see a, a fever, fatigue, malaise, two to five days after they're exposed, and we can see some respiratory distress, disorientation, coma, and finally death. And this, this uh, may last less than 24 hours from the onset to the death, so it's very, very, very quick. There's also a gastrointestinal anthrax, and this is from eating the contaminated raw meat. And we, a lesion is produced inside the intestinal walls. We have abdominal pain, nausea, anorexia, vomiting, bloody diarrhea. Uh, it is more likely to be fatal, but occurs less often than the cutaneous form, which, uh, see if we talk, I don't see any pictures on that. Um, but I believe in your book there might have been a, a picture of a black. Um, okay, uh, so be able to differentiate Bacillus anthracis from this normal flora bacillus. Uh, as a tech in the hospital, we are going to be the first people that see an outbreak like this. If a bioterrorist attack does occur, and patients start becoming sick, we are the first ones that will be in contact with these organisms. Uh, so it's our responsibility to, number one, be safe while we're working with the organisms and be aware that these guys can pop up naturally and unnaturally. Uh, so safety first. And number two, we have to be able to rule them out. So if we're unable to rule out a pathogen like Bacillus anthracis, our next step is to send that organism to someone who can, which will probably be either the state lab or the CDC themselves. So what we're called our sentinel labs, we are like the, the drones or the, the sentinels in the Army that are the first line of defense <clears throat> when it comes to uh, bioterror warfare. So, uh, large square ended gram positive rods, spore forming. Uh, we can they kind of look like a bamboo appearance, like a bamboo sheath, long 
um, chains of gram-positive rods. And then the colony morphology, you want to see non-hemolytic, uh, raised, large, gray-white. That uh, is the colony morphology for Bacillus anthracis. And then we can also see what's called a Medusa's head, which are these like finger-like projections around the edges or a beaten egg white, which is if you take your loop and touch the colony and lift your loop, there's kind of like a peak that forms. If you suspect an organism is anthrax, the first thing you want to do is get under a hood. Safety first. Next, you want to rule out the possibility of an uh, Bacillus anthracis. So first you want to check to see if the organism is hemolytic on blood auger because Bacillus anthracis is non-hemolytic. If it is hemolytic, you've ruled out Bacillus anthracis. Next you want to check to see if the organism is non-modal. If it's non-modal, you could have Bacillus anthracis. Most Bacillus are uh, motile. And next, I don't care for this on here, it should be, if it's spore forming, then it could be Bacillus anthracis. All Bacillus form spores. All right, so if it's a non-spore former, you are not working with a Bacillus, right? So here's uh, different stains of Bacillus. This is a gram stain of uh, Bacillus. Uh, this particular picture doesn't have any spores spores, maybe that could be one there, uh, but spores on gram stain are generally big clear holes in the organism. They, uh, they don't stain with the gram stain. We have to use an endospore stain, which is over here. Vegetative cells, which are growing, actively replicating cells, stain pink, and the endospores will stain green. Here we see an internal uh, terminal spore. Here are a couple more spores inside the organisms. They can also be outside of the organism or outside of the vegetative cell. Okay. So uh, characteristics to differentiate Bacillus from Bacillus cirrus, which is an organism, another Bacillus organism that causes um, foodborne diseases. So. Here we have hemolysis on blood auger, bacillus anthracis is non-hemolytic, bacillus cirrus is hemolytic. Here we've got motility, bacillus anthracis is non-modal, bacillus cirrus is motal, okay? They both produce spores. So uh, make sure as you're going through these chapters you are able to link the organism with the disease that it causes. So we just finished talking about Bacillus anthracis, which causes anthrax. Urocephalothrix rusiopathiae causes urocephalothroid, uh, which are more like wound infections. Uh, uh, Corinibacterium diphtheriae causes diphtheria. Listeria monocytogenes causes listeriosis. Actinomycosis is caused by Actinomyces israelii, and foodborne illnesses is caused by Bacillus cirrus, and nocardia causes narcardiosis.